presentation of Idaho Reports on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho, by the Friends of Idaho Public Television, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Good afternoon and welcome to a special edition of Idaho Reports and the Governor's Annual State of the State Address. I'm Erin Coons. And I'm Melissa Davlin. And joining us today for live commentary, we have Kevin Richard of Idaho Education News, Stephanie Witt of Boise State University, and Jane Revere. Um, right now, we see Governor Otter approaching the podium and he is greeting uh, members of his uh, members of the Governor, cabinet and he is about to give his address. We'll go we ahead and go live. The House chambers and we look forward to your state of the state address. The time is yours. Thank you. You know, that's the first time I just figured. Honored guests, friends, my family, and of course, our First Lady, Miss Lori. Before I begin, allow me to add my welcome and my best wishes to all the new members of the legislature joining us here today. Thank each of you for bringing your life experiences and your unique perspectives to our important work here in the People's House. Also, I have the privilege today of introducing newly elected Supreme Court Justice Robin Brody to this chamber and to the Idaho judiciary. Congratulations, Madam Justice. <laughs> the new year also brings some key departures from our executive branch of government. I'm sure you will join me in wishing Kevin Kemp Godspeed in his new national responsibilities after two eventful and successful years as the director of the Department of Corrections. We are also losing Sam Haas to a well-deserved well retirement from the Office of Aging. And Kelly Pierce's experience and leadership will be missed with his recent retirement as administrator of the Division of Building Safety. I extend my thanks and best wishes to each and every one of them. <laughs> Finally, this will be the last le legislative session for Dick Armstrong as director of the Department of Health and Welfare. His stalwart and tireless leadership has set a high standard for whoever takes on that difficult difficult and often thankless responsibility next. Dick will be retiring in June and he'll be leaving big shoes to fill. Dick, I wish you Godspeed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my high honor and privilege to report to you today that the state of Idaho is resurgent, and in fact is gaining national reputation among the states for our stability and our strength. Our finances are secure. Revenue is exceeding expectations. Economic growth is outpacing the overall growth of government, and our own operations are more transparent and efficient than they've ever been. More of our people are at work today than at any time in Idaho's history. And wages are rising, slowly but surely, along with employer demand for more skilled workers. Meeting that demand is among our most serious challenges, but we are facing it head on. And I know that you share my commitment to finding Idaho-based solutions rather than waiting for our national government's dysfunction to get turned around. So as we honor that spirit of independence and self-determination, I can testify to you today 
that our citizens are energized and engaged in growing our economy, and improving our communities, caring for our families and neighbors, but most importantly, preparing our youth for a rapidly changing world. Seldom has the future seemed either as hopeful or as uncertain as it is today, or that any state government, it is beyond, pardon me, it is beyond any state government to bring our national government into order. But it is our responsibility and our duty as elected leaders to preserve and protect the steady framework of opportunity that the people of Idaho need in order to confidently pursue their dreams and freely express their civic virtue. That's why such a large share of the executive budget recommendations you have before you continue addressing our five-year plan for improving Idaho public schools as well as our efforts to create a seamless, sustainable education and training system, extending from kindergarten through career for every Idaho citizen. My budget recommendations are about more than fulfilling our shared commitments and implementing our task force recommendations. They are more than just about living up to our constitutional responsibilities. They are even more than providing for the skilled workforce that our employers need. Ultimately, my education funding proposals are about doing the right thing for the next generation of Idahoans and laying a foundation for their refinement, refinements and adjustments to keep pace with a dynamic global marketplace. So, <clears throat> So allow me to briefly outline some of the most crucial parts of this next round of investments. My first and most significant recommendation is for an ongoing allocation of $58 million implementing the career ladder pay model for our public school teachers. <laughs> Along with the $75 million that we invested in that effort during the past two years, this new and largest tranche will keep us on track in reaching our five-year funding goal for attracting and retaining more of the best and brightest educators available. I'm also calling for an ongoing investment of $2.5 million a year for leadership training of principals in low-performing schools, and another $2.5 million a year to train school administrators on Idaho teacher evaluation framework and process. As we work to improve the competitiveness of Idaho teacher pay, it is critical that we have a solid basis for rewarding excellence. Looking beyond the recent challenges that we've experienced with teacher evaluation, this training will help ensure that school administrators can professionally, thoroughly, and meaningfully assess teacher effectiveness and help guide their professional growth. <clears throat> Another of my K-12 budget recommendations is for $15 million to help school districts cover the cost of higher health insurance premiums for their employees. That will help them avoid having to backfill those costs from discretionary funds that we only recently reinstalled in the wake of the Great Recession. Our task force recommendations called for investing a total of $60 million a year in classroom technology statewide. We've allocated $18 million so far, so now I'm asking for $10 million a year more in starting in fiscal year 2018 for making achieving our remaining technology funding goal more manageable. There's also an ongoing $6 million request in my executive budget for improving teacher professional development and the opportunities therein. The idea is to ensure that teachers have the time regularly shared to share uh, lesson plans, and instructional resources collaborate with each other and learn from one another's works and what works best in the classroom. My funding recommendation additionally includes another $5 million for expanding and improving college and career counseling in high schools. Based upon our rising college enrollment rate, that kind of investment is helping more students, parents, and educators determine the most appropriate options for enabling young people to go on to higher education 
or career technical training and certification. I'm also urging you to continue supporting the STEM Action Center and its groundbreaking computer science initiative. They already are having a significant impact on thousands of educators and tens of thousands of students. But the demand is there to expand their reach and to help ensure that every Idaho student and teacher gets the chance to embrace the STEM fields and the tremendous growth of career opportunities that they provide. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Proficiency in science, technology, engineering, and math form an increasingly essential link between K-12 and career readiness. STEM education is critical to developing those skills most in demand in today's workplace. Sometimes the challenges and complexity of life interrupt our best plans for pursuing our own career opportunities, including our good intentions to complete a college degree within a traditional four or five year span. So my budget recommendation, once again, and for 2018, includes funding for an adult completer scholarship. It will provide an incentive for those with some college credits who have been away from school for at least a three years to return to the classroom and finish up. It's an important part of our strategy for reaching the ambitious and worthy goal of ensuring that at least 60% of Idahoans between the ages of 25 and 34 have a college degree or a certification by 2020. In pursuit of that goal, I'm recommending the transfer of $35 million to the Permanent Building Fund for higher education, education facilities throughout the state. That includes $10 million for the Career Material Science Center at Boise State University. That includes $10 million for the University of Idaho to build the Fund for Agricultural Food and Environment, or the CAFE, in Magic Valley. It includes $10 million for Lewis and Clark State College to construct a career technical education building adjacent to the proposed new Lewiston High School CTE facility. And finally, $5 million toward remodeling the Gale Life Sciences building at the Idaho State University campus in Pocatello. Let me call your attention now and encourage your support for an effort to make post-secondary education in eastern Idaho more affordable for students, more competitive for businesses, and more attractive and responsive to employers' needs. I'm speaking, of course, I'm speaking, of course, of the campaign to turn Eastern Idaho Technical College in Idaho Falls into a full-fledged community college. Establishing a college of Eastern Idaho will spur economic growth and complete a comprehensive statewide system of affordable community colleges options, along with the Northern Idaho Community College, the College of Southern Idaho, and the College of Western Idaho. This completes the cycle. This body has already set aside $5 million for startup costs. Now the people of Bonneville County must decide at the polls in May whether to invest in their own future by advancing plans to provide better opportunities for students and families, for those looking to improve their career readiness, and for businesses looking to locate or expand. After seeing the difference that the College of Western Idaho has made right here in Treasure Valley, after seeing how quickly that CWI has grown to meet pent-up demand for new educational opportunities, and after seeing the overwhelming positive response from employers, the College of Eastern Idaho campaign has my full and enthusiastic support. <laughs> For those of you from Ada and Canyon counties, I also support and urge your positive consideration of the College of Western Idaho's effort to expand its Nampa campus and build a new campus here in Boise. CWI is bursting at the seams with an enrollment of 20,000 students just eight years after op opening with 1,200 students. The employers who provide jobs and tax revenue here in the Valley are relying on your help 
to meet that need. My other higher education budget priorities continue to reflect the K through career emphasis. They focus on workforce development and expanding programs at the four-year institutions and community colleges that support such in-demand career fields as energy, computer science, and health care professionals. That includes $2.4 million requests to expand the residency program in the graduate medical education that are needed to address our chronic shortage of physicians and other health care providers, especially in Idaho's more rural areas. <clears throat> As many of you know, Idaho ranks near the bottom nationally in the number of doctors and medical residents per capita. In addition, a significant percentage of our physicians are approaching retirement age. But we also know that there's a better than average chance that when aspiring physicians do their residencies in Idaho, they will stay in Idaho to practice. That's why I'm grateful for the work of the stakeholder group in developing a plan for increasing medical residencies and implementing other solutions to Idaho's phys physician shortage. That includes significantly leveraging my request for expanding residency programs with federal funds. A genuinely historic development toward making health care more accessible for all Idahoans is the Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine. Idaho's first medical school is being developed on the Idaho State University Health Sciences campus in Meridian, with construction to begin early this year. ICOM plans to have its first class of students with their studies in 2018. It already has secured 78 new residency positions for eventual ICOM graduates at hospitals throughout the region, with more on the way. So I hope you'll join me in embracing the opportunity and welcoming this important new institution to Idaho. <clears throat> I also want to offer my thanks and congratulations to the community leaders responsible for making our Behavioral Health Crisis Center program such a tremendous success. The third of our community facilities opened in Twin Falls about a month ago. It already joined sites operating in Idaho Falls and Coeur d'Alene, and a fourth is in the work here in Boise in providing accessible and cost-effective alternatives to jail or emergency room visits for those struggling with mental health or substance abuse issues. They are providing significant savings on law enforcement responses and hospital costs and already have become critical parts of the local system of care. My budget recommendation includes $1.5 million to cover the remaining costs of standing up the Twin Falls and Boise facilities. Once again, these are investments that can save our communities millions of dollars a year on the cost of emergency services. That means less stress on local taxpayers. To continue improving our statewide mental health system, I'm also requesting $10.3 million to build an adolescent mental health facility in Treasure Valley. That would also cover the cost of remodeling a unit at State Hospital South in Blackfoot as a secure mental health facility. Now let's talk for a minute about spending priorities and living within the people's means. It's no surprise that we all want tax relief or it's, some, it's a top priority in this legislative session. But I would remind you that together, we have reduced the burden of citizens on taxes during this tenure, in fact, since 2010, about $1 billion. And you'll soon have legislation before you to reduce the tax base rate for unemployment insurance paid by Idaho employers by 6.3% this year. Now that's $46 million in tax relief in the coming year alone, and $115 million over the next three years. <laughs> I'm as committed as ever to limiting the size and the growth of our state government, and we should continue to make many of the efficiencies realized during the Great Recession a part of our standard operations. But I also understand the cost of failing to invest prudently and substantially in our future. 
So I will not entertain anything that undermines our commitment to meeting the essential state government functions. And at the top of that list is our investments in improving education and career readiness in Idaho. <clears throat> We are not alone in our effort to build and improve Idaho's workforce. From STEM education to advanced research, we have a strong partner in the Idaho National Laboratory. It was great to hear recently that a $1.6 billion state-of-the-art facility for handling spent fuel from the Navy's nuclear warships will soon be built there. Now we're working with INL to strengthen the capabilities of our colleges and universities by collaborating on one of our most complex challenges, addressing the growing threat of cyber attacks, like the one that was against the Fish and Game online licensing system just last year. You soon will be seeing the work product of the Cybersecurity Task Force led by Lieutenant Governor Little. And I ask you to take its findings seriously, because make no mistake, we got off lucky last time. Cybercrime and even cyber warfare are very real and growing threats. The next hack here in Idaho could target more critical infrastructure, including our electrical grid, industrial control systems, military equipment, or even our own personal vehicles. The INL is a world leader in cybersecurity, and our partnerships there are positioning three universities to be on the cutting edge of addressing the global challenges. Work already is underway to establish and expand a joint cyber lab that I proposed and you funded last year. But we can do more to protect ourselves and secure our future. So now I'm encouraging the legislature to express its support for an even more substantial step toward Idaho leadership in cybersecurity, supercomputing, and new nuclear technologies. The State Board of Education and the Idaho National Lab and our universities are working to finance and build two world-class research facilities near the Center for Advanced Energy Studies in Idaho Falls. The Cyber Core and the Collaborative Computing Center will be financed and owned by the state, but paid for by INL through lease payments. Those payments would continue for decades long after the buildings are paid off providing another continuing revenue stream for higher education. But this initiative will pay dividends far beyond our budget. It will help to address our workforce needs by growing, growing a talent pipeline for INL and related Idaho industries. And perhaps most important, it will enable some of Idaho's best and brightest students to find high-paying career opportunities right here at home. Folks, we all aspire to be more self-reliant. We strive for it in our personal lives as well as in the operation of our state government. Few federal edicts in recent years have been more intrusive, more damaging, or more self to our self-determination than the Affordable Care Act. There is broad agreement in this body on the need to help tens of thousands of Idahoans with incomes too high to qualify for Obamacare subsidies, but too low to afford the health care coverage on their own. Just as clearly, there is very little support for expanding Medicaid. I understand that. It would mean subordinating our Idaho priorities to the Sarain, of, to the Sarain song of federal dollars, and neither the nation, national government nor taxpayers can afford either. So beyond continuing to seek elusive answers to the policy questions that we've been asking for years, we now have the option of waiting to see what the Trump administration and Congress will do with Obamacare. But waiting by itself is seldom a solution. Instead, while we wait, I would encourage you to seek ways to make Idaho less dependent on the feds. That includes continuing to build a local partnership and encouraging marketplace innovations that address our Idaho goals of improving health care, accessibility, and affordability. However, I believe that waiting in this case is not entirely an exercise in kicking an oversized can down the road. I mentioned earlier that our immediate future is marked by hope and uncertainty. 
Nowhere is that dichotomy more striking than in the upcoming change of leadership in Washington, D.C. While few people know just what to expect from President-elect or his cabinet, I am far more hopeful than anxious about the promise of a new and a better day in the relationships between the federal government and the states. Dealing, <clears throat> Dealing with Obamacare should be only the start. This is uncharted territory. There is no history or precedent from which to draw a, a, a path forward. But I, for one, look forward to the years ahead to seeing renewal of a national commitment to the principles of federalism of which our system of government was founded. For years now, we in the West have been frustrated by the increasing imposition of federal government's will over our livelihoods and the quality of our life. Regulatory bureaucracies, and entrenched interests have become practiced at reaching far beyond the letter of such laws as the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, to essentially nullify the common sense stewardship of states and local jurisdictions. I am optimistic that President-elect Trump and his team will work to ensure that meaningful reforms are implemented to keep such agencies as the EPA, the BLM, Forest Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in check. Their focus must be shifted to working more collaboratively with states to develop national policies that are flexible enough to accommodate local needs and realities. I recently provided the new administration with some detailed advice on improving the federal approach to such issue, issues as protecting the sage grouse and their habitat, delisting grizzly bears, and developing needy, needed energy infrastructure like the Gateway West Electrical Transmission Project in southern Idaho. I hope and trust that my advice will not fall on deaf ears, because Idaho has an exemplary record of managing and protecting our own natural resources. Our own citizens and communities have the civic virtue and the proven know-how to ensure that lands and resources are responsibly used for the long-term economic and recreational opportunities that they can provide. Now, I'm not advocating for the state to take over more than 60% of Idaho owned by the federal government. But we should continue to expand on the efforts we've made so far to realize the potential of such Idaho values as active management, local stewardship. Our initiative to improve water sustainability is a great example of how Idaho can do very well caring for our own needs without punitive federal oversight. Simply put, states need the opportunity to be full and equal partners in decisions that affect the land, water, wildlife, and other resources within our borders. <clears throat> States must be enabled to be the architects of our own destiny. We in Idaho already are making great use of those rare opportunities where real collaboration with the state is actually encouraged by the feds. Good example, the Good Neighbor Authority, granted under the 2014 Farm Bill, invites Idaho to increase the pace and scale of forest and watershed restoration on federal forests. Under agreements reached through the program, Idaho is a, playing a more active role in improving the health of our intermingled timberlands. That's reducing fuels and the threat to communities and watersheds from catastrophic wildfires while creating more jobs and economic benefits for our own citizens. I'm not recommending, so I am recommending, the allocation of $250,000 for additional foresters to keep advancing that effort. And thanks to your support, the Rangeland Fire Protection Program has been growing in popularity and impact. There are eight groups now organized so far throughout Southern Idaho. The BLM program provides training and equipment for local ranchers and other landowners to offer that help to stop the fires before they can devastate the landscape. In the past, about 
In the past year, about 250 Idaho ranchers provided fire suppression resistance on more than 7.7 .7 million acres of federal, state, and private lands. As a fringe benefit, letting Idaho protect the land from which they draw their livelihoods also serves to protect the sage grouse from habitat destroying wildfire, the single biggest threat to their survival. Folks, federalism can and does work, but only when it involves willing partners. This past election has provided us here in the West with a window of opportunity to make broader and better collaboration between the federal and state governments a, real, a reality. Voters have expressed the desire for government that works, both here in Boise, but also in Washington, D.C. They're tired of timid representation that seems more concerned with the next election than the next generation. They want government reflects their highest aspirations and understands that individuals, as well as states, must have both the tools and the freedom to rise up and meet their own best potential. In the recent national elections, uh, if they taught us anything, it's that the people are still in charge. Not special interest, not the news media, not even the political parties. I'm proud that Idahoans voted in support of real and substantial change in our national government and against the stuck in the mud business as usual. Now it's up to us to put the lessons of 2016 to work for Idaho. Now it's time to recognize the differences in, that we may have in policy, in personalities, or in priorities do not mean differences in principle. More than ever, we now have the opportunity and the responsibility as citizens to help secure Idaho's future. So good luck. Thank you for your attention, your talents, and your willingness to serve. My door is always open, and I look forward to your conscientious and constructive work during this first regular session of the 64th Idaho Legislature. May God continue to bless Idaho and the United States of America. Thank you. All right, so you've been listening to Governor Otter give his State of the State address roughly about 30 minutes here. And what we're going to see is uh, the House chambers uh, with both the Senate and, and uh, the House members go at ease for just a second. And we're told that uh, they're going to have a special presentation. Right after that, we'll bring in our panelists and get some reaction to what the governor said in his State of the State and budget address. Thank you, Governor, for those uh, remarks. And I would ask the members to be seated but remain in your seats. Gentleman from 14 has a little announcement for us. Or at least a motion. Or a motion. Anyway, gentleman from 14. Mr. Speaker, I move that the Governor's State of State address be placed in the journals of both the House and the Senate. Mr. Speaker, I second that motion. You've heard the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and the journal will be put in the, in the journals. The, the address will be put in the journals. The joint session at this point will be at ease, and the governor is going to make a special presentation of the uh, Medal of Achievement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members of the joint session. This is the 11th time that I've stood before you and talked about how great it is that we live in a state as blessed as Idaho. I'm reminded at times like these that we place tremendous value on that unit of enlightenment and self-interest that was here so long before any of us were government. I'm speaking of that remarkable institution that we call the family. That's how I think of Idaho as a large extended family. And like any family, we have our share of challenges and disagreements. But when we do, we gather under this roof, and we usually work them out. But I'm also reminded that being in a family isn't just about dealing with problems. 
It also should be about celebrating each other's success. And that's what I want to do now. Two years ago, with the help and gracious sponsorship of Hecla Binding Company, we created an award, a medallion, made of almost 20 ounces of pure silver. This medallion was designed to be the highest civilian honor that the state of Idaho bestows on any one of her citizens. I want to thank Hecla Mining President and CEO Phil Baker for providing the silver to make this award possible. We created a bipartisan panel of some of our leading citizens to consider nominations. I want to thank former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Linda Koppel Trout, former Secretary of State, Ben Usursa, Percy Board Member, Kirk Sullivan, and the Idaho Business for Education Chairman, Skip Oppenheimer, for inventing the wheel during the rollout of this prestigious award. Justice Koppel Trout is in the gallery, and I would ask her to please stand and be recognized. They had a very difficult job, but they were guided by the principles of advancing individuals who have proven exceptional, notorious, and inspirational service to the people of Idaho. By every measure, the first recipient of the Idaho Medal of Achievement is an inspirational leader. So now I would ask the Sergeant of Arms to escort the first recipient of the Idaho Medal of Achievement into the well of the house. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you America and Idaho's teacher in space, Barbara Morgan. Thank you. If you'd please be seated. Barbara Morgan is an Idaho educator first and an astronaut second. She began her teaching career over 40 years ago at the Flathead Indian Reservation in western Montana, where she taught Native American children reading and math. Soon after, she was teaching kids in McCall, Idaho, where she and her husband, Clay, made their home. She taught there for 24 years. And for most, that would be enough, but not for Barbara. <laughs> in 1985, she applied for and was accepted in NASA's Teacher in Space program and served as backup to Christy McCullough. Tragically, the 1986 Challenger disaster claimed the lives of McCullough and her fellow crew members. During those dark days, it was unclear whether we would ever have another teacher in space. But after mourning the loss of her colleagues and friends, Barbara quietly and diligently got back to the hard work of being an astronaut. And I would like to point out that her formal NASA title was teacher astronaut, not astronaut teacher. The emphasis on education was always first. As proof of that, Barbara returned to Idaho after she retired from NASA to work at Boise State University where she created new programs which broadened the horizons of students all over Idaho. So it is uniquely fitting that the first recipient of the Idaho highest civilian honor goes to a pioneering educator who brought the dream of spaceflight to our students from a classroom high above the clouds. Her career as an educator and then as an astronaut not only inspired a generation of young people about the importance of science, it was also a reminder of how high you can reach when you aspire to do great things. Barbara has taught her students something else, the virtue of patience. She trained and waited for 21 years after the Challenger tragedy 
before getting her opportunity to fly and teach from space. Finally, in August of 2007, she became America's first teacher in space. But here at home, she will always be remembered as a pioneer member of our greater Idaho family. Will the clerk, Kirk, please give me the Idaho Medal of Achievement. You're welcome. I can get, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> wow. All right, you've been watching the uh, awarding of now Idaho's highest award, the Idaho Medical Medal of Achievement to Barbara Morgan. She's going to be speaking here to that full chamber. And if you want to watch that address, uh, we urge you to go over to one of our sister stations in Idaho in session. You can also see that online uh, if you Google Idaho in session, and we'll go ahead and make that available on the Idaho Reports blog. Uh, joining us today in the studio, we have Kevin Richard of Idaho Education News, Stephanie Witt of Boise State University, and Jamie Revere, who helped the governor craft his budget. And so we, we want to get your takeaways from the budget, especially, Kevin, your thoughts on public education. Well, I don't think there are a whole lot of surprises here in terms of where the money is going to go. Uh, the top priority, as we would have expected, is the career ladder, the teacher salary plan. That's funded, but maybe foreshadowing what we may see unfold during this legislative session, some discussion about the issue of evaluations, teacher evaluations and teacher evaluation data. Uh, that definitely was a, an undercurrent in what the governor talked about in presenting his recommendation on the $58 million. He's uh, proposed two and a half million dollars to train administrators in how to do the evaluations uh, more effectively. And Janie, what was already promised in that five-year plan and what's new this year? So in the five-year plan when it comes to career ladder, we've already invested 75 million into that. So this is the largest investment of 58 million. Um, the governor has continued to invest in technology uh, that um, Task force recommended 60 million, and uh, if the legislature goes with our 10 million uh, recommendation, we'll be at um, about half of that. Uh, professional development, we're going to make another investment in. Um, there are, um, we've made progress on each and every one of the recommendations, um, but we still have a ways to go. Uh, this is only year three of a five-year plan, and the governor is committed to seeing it through. What's the total percentage of, of the general fund budget that education now uh, uses each year? Uh, about two-thirds of the budget. Or about 63 percent, I believe, is what you said. Yes. And Kevin, I'm curious, because over the past few months especially, we've seen a little bit of dysfunction on display between the State Board of Education, the Department of Education, and lawmakers who are unhappy with how the teacher evaluation mm -hmm. process has gone that you mentioned. Is that going to jeopardize any part of this, whether it's the 58 million that's been promised for three years now, right. or any of the new elements? Well, I think some of that dysfunction can be seen in how this uh, evaluations training budget breaks down. It goes to the State Board of Education. It doesn't go to the State Department of Education. And as you recall, as we've watched this unfold over the past few months, it's been a lot of uh, a lot of tension between Sherry Ibarra and the other members of the State Board of Education. So the fact that this is moving towards the State Board is, uh, I think, a manifestation of that. As for what this means for the career ladder, I think it's too early to tell, but at the AP legislative preview on Friday, uh, House Speaker Scott Bedke was talking about we need to get the evaluation system right, we need to have something that's working, but he was taking pains to say that he does not want it to jeopardize the $58 million for pay raises. It's probably important to point out uh, that when we talk about some of the discussions that's going to take place over the next few months, that both the House and the Senate picked up some Republican seats. This is not a case where we're going to see a lot of... Uh, uh, disagreements between two parties. This will be disagreements within one party. Correct. But what we have seen over the past couple of sessions when you get down to the actual education budgets and the votes on the floor, widespread bipartisan support in the past couple of legislative sessions to where you've only had maybe a, a handful of maybe more arch conservative, almost kind of backbencher legislators opposing those budgets. No opposition at all in the Senate the past couple of years. So it'll be interesting to see if that sort of uh, spirit of bipartisanship 
uh, survives through this uh, third year of funding the career ladder and working through the evaluations issue. Mm -hmm. And there was also a lot of talk about higher education. Stephanie, I'm curious what your takeaway was when it comes to the K through career big mm -hmm. picture. Well, you know, that's a challenge that the state's been trying to address for several years with our go on goal of, of trying to get 60% of uh, Idaho adults involved in some kind of post-secondary education, whether it's career technical ed or, or higher education generally. And the uh, forming of a task force will, will be helpful in identifying ways to approach those goals. Um, now, the task force and its relationship to the existing State Board of Education and the Department of Ed and the legislature kind of adds to that complexity Kevin was just talking about. Who There is no singular driver for policy direction uh, that is shared among uh, all of those actors, uh, not to mention that each of the universities has its own set of leaders and and uh, constituencies. So it, it, it should be an interesting process. It's um, something we're seeing a lot of states investigate. I think the, the goal is to try to get the best return possible on our higher education investments. Janie, the, uh, in there, in the budget, $35 million is going to higher education, particularly the uh, community colleges, and it was broken down. You, you broke that down at a news conference just before the State of the State and budget address. Could you go back through those and describe how they're going to be uh, utilized, particularly um, in, in eastern Idaho? I know that uh, the, the idea or the goal from the governor is to turn the, uh, the college that's in Idaho Falls into a full-fledged community college. So last year the budget recommendation was for $5 million for the community college in eastern Idaho. Um, the legislature supported that and the $5 million is setting there and it's ready for the, um, the uh, community to decide if they're going to go forward with a community college or not. Um, the $35 million in the governor's uh, budget is a transfer to the permanent building fund for an investment in higher education. That would be uh, $10 million for Boise State University for the material science uh, building, uh, $10 million for University of Idaho for the um, cafe building. It's the Center for Agriculture, Food, and Environment um, in the Magic Valley. Um, we've got another $10 million for Lewis and Clark State College for the, um, uh, for a new college, I'm sorry, career and technical education building. And then lastly, there is $5 million for um, Idaho State University. This is in addition to the $5 million they're getting from the permanent building fund. So a total of $10 million for ISU to renovate the Gale Life Sciences building, the third and fourth floor. And to be clear, this isn't all the money that all of those facilities need to uh, build what they want to build. This is seed money and they need to get other funding elsewhere. Correct. BSU has the funding. The other t uh, U of I and LCSC um, need to get the rest of the funding for their projects. Um, ISU is a, a renovation and so that's all state funded. Uh, let's move on to health care. And Governor Otter announced that the head of the Department of Health and Welfare, Dick Armstrong, is retiring this summer. Um, I'm curious, the state has been trying for years and years to address indigent health care in the state, whether it's expanding Medicaid, which the governor said so eloquently that there's no appetite for, we want to resist the siren song of federal dollars, he said, without kicking the oversized can down the road. Will Armstrong's retirement affect those efforts? Well, I, I suppose it could. It might make it easier to wait and see what the Trump administration and the Congress is going to do, if anything, in regard to Obamacare. I think um, my guess is that that's going to turn out to be a lot more complicated than just saying, let's repeal Obamacare. There are parts of that law that are popular with people. For example, um, retaining your children on your health insurance until they're age 25, something like that, or, or uh, not being eliminated from insurance from uh, prior existing conditions. Some of those things are quite popular and so when you begin to untangle that and the existing state exchanges, it's, it's not going to be something that happens in a week. It's going to take a while. So I think the new director, by the time that the new director uh, comes in, we may know a little more about what uh, the new administration and the new Congress are going to do. Uh, but my guess is that's still going to be in its infancy and so that person will um, uh, be able to make an impact and see what the feds are going to do first and then we can respond here. I, it, from the outside it has appeared that we've been waiting for years, I mean, for this, that the strategy had been let's wait and see if we get a different president and a different answer about Obamacare 
the whole time. So I think this fits with the strategy the state has taken. And Janie, I don't want to give the impression that this is the governor hopes this will be a do nothing session for health care. Uh, he actually had some aggressive recommendations for mental health care specifically. Uh, the governor's proposing transferring funding to the permanent building fund to um, create a new hospital here in the Treasure Valley for the adolescents and um, then renovate the state hospital south, um, that current adolescent facility, uh, renovate it to provide a secure mental health facility. Mm -hmm. And I know that the budget committee toured that facility a couple years ago um, and saw that it's in disrepair. We're not talking about renovations to make it comfortable. We're talking about basic maintenance, right? Mm -hmm. And to make it secure. And to mm -hmm. make it secure. Right? Right. Right. That building, I was actually there with the lawmakers when they went through that building. That's this right. is a building that's extremely old. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of places that are literally unsafe for people to be in. A lot of building, parts of those buildings that are uh, not safe for people to actually go into. So I think that money would be well, well used. One thing we didn't hear though from the governor uh, is um, his desire for tax cuts. As a matter of fact, it, we heard quite the opposite thereof. Stephanie, um, we've heard that when anytime you have uh, somewhat of a surplus in your budget that it's time to, to make some tax cuts, the governor didn't lay that out today. Well, there is one in there. There is the business employment uh, tax reduction, uh, alt overall 6.3%. Uh, that for most, uh, uh, Janie shared with me earlier, that for most businesses and organizations that's going to be almost a 30 percent reduction of, for their personal uh, part of that uh, business unemployment tax. So that, there is that. But overall, uh, I think the governor uh, is not recommending a large tax. When you look at a $120 million surplus, they're not recommending a lot of uh, that being returned in the form of a tax cut. He sees investments that, that are necessary in education. Uh, and but I'd like to also add on that, that, that I think as a state we need to be careful. If there is a significant tax reform at the federal level, conformity could be extremely costly next year. Yeah. It's true. But the question remains as we head into this legislative session, when you've got a nine-digit uh, surplus yeah. uh, hanging fire, will this uh, tax relief that would help businesses, that wouldn't help uh, would not help homeowners, it wouldn't help uh, families, it wouldn't help the working poor. Is that tax relief going to satiate the appetite within the state house for more mm -hmm. uh, broad based and maybe more populist tax reform? We'll see. Right. Well, well, oh, we're going to stop there just a second. Uh, we do have our producer, Seth O'Gilvy, who's down at the state capitol getting a reaction from the minority party. Seth, uh, what are you hearing? Well, yeah, we're here with uh, minority leader Michelle Stennett. And, uh, so what was your takeaway? That we heard a lot about education, but what did you hear? Well, I was very pleased to hear that the governor is putting so much into education again. I, can think, I think that everybody can agree that that is our primary uh, interest. It is directly, um, we're responsible for it, but also it uh, has a direct impact on our economy to have a skilled workforce. As he said, that Idaho is uh, growing and the economy is improving and we are doing better than a lot of places in the nation. And But we still have to have that skilled workforce to fill all those positions that we create. So I think that along with the higher education component with his task force and uh, taking care of the uh, facilities was an important part of the speech. And I heard the governor kind of draw a line in the sand, say no tax cuts without fulfilling these promises to education. Is that what you heard? I did. Um, he he had said that he w wants to make sure that we take care, have the responsibility of taking care of our programs, and I'm pleased to hear that because we have transportation infrastructure. We have. Um, I was pleased to hear that he talked about cybersecurity because I'd been mentioning it over the last few days, and it can be housed within um, the Idaho National Laboratories and programs that are still within Idaho. It's a very important piece of what we need to be looking at. So he rolled out some other things that we should be putting our monies towards to make sure that the state's operating better. And I'm sure we'll have a lot more takes on this as the uh, session continues. But for now, let's send it back to Erin and Melissa in the studio. All right. Thanks so much, Seth. Uh, you know, I want to get back to this conversation that we kind of touched on right before we threw back to Seth about this push and pull with general fund dollars with transportation, education, and tax cuts. And we have heard this every year that I can remember uh, a governor, since Governor Otter was sworn in for the first time in 2008. And so what's, what's going to be different this year? Are you expecting anything different, Kevin? I'm not sure I'm expecting very much of anything different, but what maybe is significant is uh, this speech, uh, through omission largely, 
uh, opens up a lot of opportunities or a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of latitude for the legislative branch. I mean, there was no mention of the transportation issue, which uh, the governor said on Friday at the AP preview that he still thinks there's a problem here, but really not addressed, and, and no address of tax relief beyond the, uh, the unemployment tax uh, reduction we talked about. But he, but he said that for years, that there's a problem with transportation. He, I mean, that was the hill he picked to die on in 2008, right. and it didn't make much of a difference then. Mm -hmm. And so uh, are, you, are you expecting anything? On transportation, I think it's really hard to tell uh, what to, to expect there. I, I think you're going to have potentially a pretty uh, protracted battle over uh, tax, tax cuts. Uh, the governor mentioned last week that he'd already received several uh, proposals, several ideas from legislators. I doubt it's the last he's going to hear. Janie, what are the realities uh, when we come to education? We heard when he made that big push in his first, uh, uh, when he was first elected, that we had about a $263 million shortfall. And that's just to maintain the roads that are already there. That's not new roads. When you go back and, and you start looking at some of the numbers to come up with your, your annual budget, is it impossible to think that we can hit the numbers that would adequately fund roads and, and transportation here in the state of Idaho? In order to adequately fund the transportation in the state, uh, as the task force recommended, it would require a, an additional source of revenue. Um, our current revenue is nowhere close to where it needs to be just to sustain the maintenance. And uh, the governor does not support using general fund. He does not want to put roads against students. And so uh, he believes that we need to increase in a, our dedicated funds in order to fund the transportation shortfall. And for our viewers at home, dedicated funds are things like gas tax and registration fees, right. things Correct. like that. Uh, Stephanie, we have about a minute left, but uh, can you briefly walk us through your sense of what the state legislature is going to wait and see on when it comes to the federal government? Well, uh, the first thing they're going to wait and see on is whether or not the governor continues to be governor or whether he goes to Washington, <laughs> D.C. as the uh, Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, after that, I think they were going to see if there are major changes in the state health exchanges and the Obamacare law and what that looks like. And um, those impacts will probably not be immediate, but it could give some direction to uh, what options we have for providing health care for Idahoans who currently can't access it. Any indication that there's going to be any sort of wait to see if there's an influx of transportation dollars? Uh, well, now the Trump administration has indicated a real interest in, in improving transportation funding. We may see some options on the table that we've not seen in recent years. All right, we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much, Kevin, uh, for being here, and Janie and Stephanie, thank you so thank much, you. and Seth down at the Capitol. Of course, our regular Idaho reports will return back on air this coming Friday. Till then, good night. presentation of Idaho Reports on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho, by the Friends of Idaho Public Television, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.